Ever heard of lab color in Photoshop? Not RGB, not CMYK, but LAB Lab. Designed to simulate the way human beings perceive color, Lab is crazy useful for correcting images. Over the course of this video, we're going to take this obviously, dare I say, painfully underexposed photograph right here, and we're going to completely and utterly transform it into this brightly lit image. And what I want to emphasize is is that this kind of thing, not only is it obviously possible, but we're not really fundamentally transforming the image. What, I'm, what I mean to say is everything that we need to achieve this final effect is already here. It's just a matter of redistributing the luminance levels inside the image. Now, because the whole purpose of, of what I'm doing here right now is to convey an unusual approach, something you may not have done before, which is to apply a color adjustment in the lab color mode. I'm gonna compare it to two much more common approaches. So what you might wanna do, right? You see this, you can go, okay, you know, I'll just go ahead and brighten it up by applying an adjustment layer in the RGB mode, which is definitely easy to do, as we'll see in just a moment. However, it, it gets you only so far. So I am trying, in each case, to do the best job I can with what I have to work with. And so this is an adjustment layer in RGB once again. And you can tell that we're working in the RGB mode because you can see the letters RGB up here in the title tab inside the parentheses. And uh, RGB, by the way, in case you don't know, stands for red, green, and blue light, which are the primary colors of light. Now, you it, 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 over the course of time, you may decide that this is not the best approach, which it isn't. And that's been demonstrated time and time again. And so you might instead apply the camera raw filter here inside Photoshop, which is going to give you a better looking image. You may notice the difference right away. If not, then we'll explore it in more detail. The problem with the camera raw filter is that it's more difficult to apply uh, dynamically so that you can change your mind so that it's editable, in other words, and it comes with quite the overhead as we're about to see. And then finally, this is the result of applying a color adjustment in the lab color mode. You can see it's lab, not only because the file name in, includes the word lab, but also because we're seeing LAB here inside the parentheses. L stands for lightness or luminance, if you prefer. A and B are arbitrary letters that are assigned to two additional channels of information. If you're familiar with temperature and tint, then temperature is B and tint is A, for what it's worth. So two different axes of color gives you a lot more control and it allows you to create smoother results as well. So let's start with the RGB correction for just a moment. I want you to see that I've assigned it as an adjustment layer here inside the layers panel. Notice I have a layer called uh, forgive me and the flashing that's occurring right here. But what we've got is a layer called brighten and all it is is a layer of numbers, numerical adjustments. And so I could turn it off if I wanted to, and I'll see the original underexposed image. And so again, it's just, you know, I'm just brightening from what I got. So I'm not changing a single pixel, not permanently inside the photograph. And if you're so inclined, you can see the values that I applied up here inside the properties panel. Notice this is a levels adjustment. Many people prefer to work with curves. I've never understood why. There's very little that you can do with curves that you can't do with levels. Neither of them is going to give you a much better result. What is going to give you a much better result, as I've said, is Camera Raw. The penalty with Camera Raw, one of them, is that you're not going to be able to access the numbers here inside the properties panel. Instead, you have to enter a totally different workspace by, in my case, I'm going to go ahead and double click on camera raw filter right here in order to bring up 
camera, at which point I can twirl open light and you can see that I've cranked up the exposure quite a bit. A value of plus 1.5 is a big adjustment. I've also taken down the contrast because if I didn't, if I left the contrast as high as it started, then we'll end up with a very hot looking image, which is why I'm redistributing those luminance levels using contrast. So I'm basically, by reducing contrast, I'm spreading the luminance levels out. So I'm taking the shadows, the darkest luminous levels, and I'm spreading them out into the midtones, which are the middle ones, as you know, you might you might figure. And then the highlights too. The highlights are the brightest of the uh, luminous levels, and we're spreading them out into the midtones as well, and we're getting smoother results. I also went ahead and increased the vibrance value in order to selectively increase, not saturation, no, vibrance is the one we're looking for. I'll see if that tool tips go, goes ahead and comes up. That's it there. And it selectively increases the intensity of the colors inside your image. So just three modifications, that's it. However, a lot of overhead associated with this filter. I'll just go ahead and click OK, even though I didn't really do anything. What I had to do was convert the, the image into a smart object and then apply camera raw filter. That way it, it is, it, it, I can modify it later. It's an editable effect, in other words. Whereas if I'm working inside the lab color mode, once again, I'm just working with this adjustment layer. Same adjustment layer, it's levels. Once again, different values this time around, but ultimately the same darn thing. Same basic approach. All you're doing is working in a different color mode. Now you might say to me, Deke, I, I need more convincing. I need to really super understand why in the world I'd go with lab. Well, let me, let me see if I can help you along right here. Uh, what I've got is these labels right here, which are telling you how big the image is because the file size changes dramatically as we're working. So we're starting, even though this image is a layered image because it has this text, but otherwise it would be flat. And if I were to save it at the highest quality setting possible as a JPEG file, it comes in at 3.8 megabytes. So not very big, it's just a 10 megapixel image. And so kind of a moderate resolution that I have going. Real quick, want to learn how to correct color balance? Not using the color balance command, that thing's trash, but using levels in a lab mode. In which case, join my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash now. And now back to the wonders of lab. Whereas if I switch over to my RGB image, they're, they're both RGB, by the way, I just haven't changed the color mode. Every image you capture with a digital camera is RGB by definition. That's how almost like 99.99% of images are captured. And notice right here that we have an adjustment layer. So now I have to save the image as a layered file. So I can't use JPEG because JPEG doesn't support layers. That automatically means that the image is going to be a lot bigger. So instead of being just 3.86 megabytes, it now is a PSD file with an adjustment layer. That doesn't inherently take up a lot of room. But the fact that it's not compressed anymore, it's not taking advantage of JPEG compression. We have a 28.28.28, that is, megabyte file. And so it's basically 28 divided by 4 with four megabytes. So it's about seven times larger, even more than that. So much, much larger. That's nothing compared to this image right here. The fact that I've converted this image into a smart object just dramatically expands its size, makes it much, much, it balloons the image. And then you're applying a non-destructive smart filter in the form of camera raw, which is about the meatiest filter there is. The, the, the image grows like crazy to 84.58 megabytes. So PSD with a smart object is much bigger than PSD with an adjustment layer. Notice the difference there. And way, way bigger than a flat JPEG image. So that is the big thing. If you're willing, if you're okay with big, huge files on disk, they're not really any harder to work with necessarily. And if you're comfortable with Camera Raw, that's great. Because Camera Raw does work. It does its magic inside a variety, a kind of contained variety of the lab color mode. So it doesn't strictly speaking, even though it delivers RGB results and it speaks to you in the language of RGB, it is working in a 
device independent color mode, something resembling, not identical to, but resembling old school lab. And I say old school because it's been with us forever. And then we'll see if I switch back to the lab color mode, which isn't any bigger inherently than RGB. It still requires three color channels. So they're just lightness A and B instead of being red, green, and blue. We have an adjustment layer, which doesn't take up that much more room. And so it's actually a little smaller. Notice that it weighs in a little smaller. That's just a coincidence. It's one of those quirks. But it, it ends up being a little bit smaller than the RGB correction, even though it's a better correction, as we're about to see, I assure you. And then what you want to do when you're done, because nobody really works with lab, right? You want to convert it back to RGB at the end of the day, which is going to look like this. So this is the same image. Notice it looks identical. If you were to compare the two ad nauseum, you would see that they are pixel for pixel identical. And this guy's 6.55 megs when saved as a flat JPEG. Once again, you just go ahead and get rid of, you know, you just flatten the layers. We'll see what that looks like eventually. And uh, and and so it's 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 a little larger than the original. But that happened, that's because of the distribution, the better distribution of luminous levels. And, and as a result, it doesn't compress quite as well using JPEG compression. So you get a bigger file, but you also get a much better file as we're seeing. All right, so how do you really gauge the difference? I am going to show you how to do this, by the way, but I want you to be convinced that this is the way to go. I know some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's the way to go. No, one more thing I want, I want to show you. Notice, by the way, let's switch back to the original image. Go to the window menu and choose histogram because I want you to see the histogram panel. And if you see this little caution icon right there, you just click on it to update the histogram, but we don't want the text. Notice, okay, let me explain a histogram in case you don't know what's going on, but this is brief. It is a bar graph, a column graph of all the luminous levels inside the image, starting with black over here on the left and ending with white on the right. So this doesn't tell you where the luminous levels are located, just their quantity. So in other words, we've got a lot of dark stuff. Does that surprise you? An awful lot of dark stuff in this image. These are the shadows. Not very much in a way of highlights, so the bright stuff, not much going on there. And then you know, the hefty amount of midtones, but not as much as shadows. Now, there's a lot of, see that spike of white right there? That's because of the label right there, the white label. And so if I turn that off, it goes away. Notice, and I'll just go ahead and update just in case. So you can see that we really don't have white inside this image. Now, I have the channel set to RGB. I just want you to see. And if I go to the hamburger there, I've set it to expanded view. And I am just seeing, well, I'm not seeing all the channels in color and I'm not seeing all the channels. There's an all channel view right here if you like it. But anyway, this is what we got. Notice though, here's what I want you to really see. It's smooth. This is a smooth histogram. You might object to the distribution of luminous levels that we have so many dark colors and no bright colors really to speak of and not much in the way of in-between midtones, but we have very, very smooth transitions. Things get a little spiky right here, which is to be expected because we have so much in a way of dark stuff. And then we ultimately do have black inside this image. Compare to the RGB correct direction. Look at that. I'm going to turn off the labels once again so we don't have that spike at the end and update just so we can see that we have a very bad histogram. Now, the distribution's a lot better. We have more midtones. We have less in the way of shadow detail. We have more. I would, I would argue we've got more in the way of, of highlights, but we've got gaps. So it's not just a little bit of spikiness, which we'll see again, and weird spikiness. We see a whole different level of spikes right there, but we've also got gaps like this. And what that tells you is that there are luminance levels that go unrepresented in this image. And so in other words, we've got black over here on the left, we've got white over here on the right, and we've got all these luminance levels in between, 256 per channel for a total of 16.8 million, by the way in a standard 8-bit per channel image, which this is. It's not really necessary we get that like sort of in the weeds, but what you do want to notice is that they're, they're just, they're 
luminance levels that are just not here. They're just gone. And as a result, let's just go ahead and zoom in on this guy right here so you can see that we have some kind of bright reds going on in the spots. These aren't representative. There are no reds in the spots of this lizard. They're all pretty much the same color, and yet they look much brighter in some areas than others. And so what we've got is a modification, a color adjustment that's not uniform across the entire image. And that is a function of working in RGB with an adjustment layer that is in RGB. And we also have, let me see if I can find a good example here. We also have, notice that noise that's going on. That is a function. Let's zoom in just a little more just in case you can't see it. That is a function of the fact that we have gaps in the luminance chart right there. It just means that these neighboring pixels are budding each other and they're very different. And so that's that, that gets you noise. All right, so I'll just go ahead and zoom out here. And you can see that we've got, as a result, we have this color fringing around the spots and the, the snout of the lizard is much brighter than it ought to be compared with its hindquarters and so forth. Terrible, terrible histogram. You don't want this. This is what you get rid of. You smooth things out by switching to lab. Let's go over to ACR. So I was telling you, of course, that ACR, the Adobe Camera Raw, is working in its own little kind of, you know, private Idaho. Essentially, it's got, it's got its own lab going. So I'll just go ahead and turn off the text so we don't have that white over there. Update it. And notice that we've got smooth, nice smooth histogram, nice distribution as well. That's Camera Raw for you. It, it does a sweet job, even though it results in an enormous file size like that guy right there. And also, though, we, I'll update that again, we have spikes. Now, but what we don't have, so spikes aren't great. You don't want spikes necessarily, but we don't have gaps. And so as a result, we don't have that kind of color noise. We do have some weird drifting of color going on where we have these kind of reds in the spots toward the snout, and then they turn kind of almost black toward the in the, in the middle of the lizard. And we have some noise, we do, but it's not nearly as prevalent as it is in the standard RGB correction. And then let's take a look at lab and I'll turn off the label so we don't have white and I'll update and you're looking at this and you're going, Deke, what, what? I thought, I thought lab was supposed to be good. Why does this look like the most garbagey histogram conceivable on the face of the planet? Because after all, we not only have spikes, we have gaps. We have lots and lots of gaps in the shadows. And yet if you zoom in, notice we don't have those wandering colors up here toward the front of the animal, and we don't have nearly as much noise. There is noise. That's gonna happen because we're pulling out the shadows. We're, we're taking the original shadow detail and we're spreading it outward. As you can see, exhibited by these gaps in the histogram. But as soon as you take this image, this is the, we're working in lab at this point. This is the lab color mode. So we're seeing a lab composite view right here in the histogram. However, notice what happens if we take it and we say, okay, now let's take it back into RGB. It goes ahead and smooths. Let's turn off the text so we don't have quite the white right there. That white spike, well, we still do have a white spike somehow. And we have a black spike over here as well. But we don't have any gaps in a histogram because basically we've gone from one color model to another. We've gone from a, a, a device-dependent color model, RGB, right, which is the, and I say device-dependent because it's dependent upon your camera, it's dependent upon your screen, it's dependent upon any device that lights up or captures light, and, whereas... Lab does not. Lab is color. Is, lab is device independent, and so it's designed to emulate the way your eyes see color. Now I know I wait till now to tell you that, but now the fact that you took it out of the device dependent mode, did some work to it, and then brought it back into the device dependent mode means that you went ahead and smoothed out this histogram. Same thing is happening when you go back and forth with Camera Raw. Similar thing is happening, I should say. However, here you just get to control the process. You get a nice smoothish, got some spikes going on, very spiky in the shadows, but we don't have any gaps. And so, how in the world do you do such a thing? How do you apply a, a common everyday average color adjustment? in the lab mode. Well, the first thing you wanna do is convert from RGB to lab. And so I'm gonna right click inside the image. And the reason I'm doing this is I wanna create a new document so that I'm not affecting the existing one. 
just starting fresh, don't you know? And as a result, I'll end up with a flat background inside the layers panel, nothing more. Now I'm gonna switch over to the channels panel so that we can see our RGB channels. And by the way, if it's not right next door to the layers panel, then go to the window menu and choose channels. And notice that we have independent grayscale images by default, you'll see grayscale, for the red, green, and blue channels. Now in my case, the green channel's in pretty good shape. It's pretty smooth detail. Red's a little iffier, so notice that we have a little bit of banding in that blurry sky and we have some wavering luminous levels across the spot. So they start very dark in the body and then they go bright in the head or lighter anyway. And that's why they have kind of a red cast to them in the RGB correction we were seeing right there. Notice that. That's a function of the brightening in the red channel. And then the blue channel is just an absolute disaster. Notice that we have banding all over the place, lots of noise. Very fragile detail, which is pretty typical of blue channels inside RGB images. So switch back to the RGB composite, go up to the image menu, choose mode, and then you want to choose lab color. Now, unlike switching to CMYK, for example, lab is not a destructive modification. So CMYK, switching back and forth between RGB and CMYK is mucho incredibly destructive. It's essential sometimes, but it does change every the color of every single pixel in the image. Whereas theoretically, lab, not so much. So you can switch back and forth between lab and RGB as many times as you want. Again, theoretically, I would you know keep it to a minimum. Probably want to go to lab, do your lab business, and then go back to RGB. But in any event, I'll switch to lab. And you're gonna see a different histogram. Notice that, but it is nice and smooth. It's got some spikes, but it doesn't have any gaps. And then we've got three different channels. So we have a lab composite. We've got a lightness channel, which contains all the luminance levels from black to white inside the image. And then we have A and B. And so I was telling you, that A and B are arbitrary designations. They don't stand for anything, in other words. There's not a B word right here or an A word. And they don't look like much. You can see that, but you can make more sense of them if you switch to B, for example, and then turn on lightness as well. So we're seeing just the lightness and B channels. And that way we're seeing that we have a lot of yellow detail. This image doesn't contain blue, but you might see a lot of blue as well. And that's because your yellow to blue axis when you're measuring color is your temperature axis. Whereas if I switch to A, we're gonna see the pinks or the magentas to the kind of turquoise. Some people call them greens, not greens at all. But in any event, this is your tint information. And then you add those two axes of colors, that is to say tint and temperature, A plus B, and you get all the colors in this particular image. Now I'll switch back to lab. I'll switch back to my layers panel. And what I want to do is add a levels adjustment layer. And so I could just click on this little black white icon and choose levels right there. It's going to give you the most control. Curves will mimic the behavior of levels, they do pretty much the same thing. Curves is a little more enabled if you need that, but generally you don't. And levels, in my opinion, is way easier to use, makes a lot more sense. Now, I digress, because what I really wanted to tell you is if you choose levels at this point, it's just gonna auto name the layer. If you wanna name it, if you wanna assign a name as you create it, then you press the option key and choose levels or you press the Alt key here in a PC and right click on that black white icon and choose levels. So it's an Alt right click, choose, right choose, I guess, on the PC where it's an option standard, choose the command on the Mac. And I'll just go ahead and call this guy Brighton because after all, I am hoping to brighten the image. Did I spell that right? It looks like I did. I'll click OK. And I end up with this default layer mask. I don't need it, so I'll just press the backspace key to get rid of it or you could right click and choose delete. What I wanna do is work on the histogram. Notice I got another histogram here in the levels, the, le the, the, the properties panel, that is to say. It looks a little different, it's expressed differently than it is inside the histogram panel and that's because I'm looking at the composite view inside histogram. If I switch to lightness, which is what I'm working on, notice the lightness channel is the only one that I'm working on. When I'm working on a lab image, I can just peel off 
lightness and work on it by itself because otherwise with RGB by default you're working on the RGB composite but anyway working on lightness by itself can be very handy and it does match this histogram and so the first thing I'd want to do is brighten up those whites so I'll take this to let's say 225 is the value I'm looking for. Can you see it right there? 225. And the reason I'm doing that is you, you want to make all this stuff is garbage, right? There isn't, there aren't any really super bright colors inside this image. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying anything that in this case is brighter than a luminous level of 124, 255 being white, zero being black is, is, is going to be white. I don't want that. I want to just make some of the stuff white. I just want to crop, you know, the, the very brightest colors of which there aren't any. What, what I want to do is take anything 225 and brighter and make it white. And that way we have some whites inside this image because otherwise we don't. And then I'll take this gamma value right here and I'm going to drag it to the uh, left. I'm dragging this gray slider triangle to the left until I get a value. I'm actually interested in a value of 2.2. And what you're doing, oh my God, this is so geeky, but you're taking the luminance levels measured differently than we're seeing them right here. And you're taking them to the, you're squaring them. You're taking them to the 2.2 power. And that way you're just brightening the midtones inside the image. So it's a big difference though. Notice that. And so by taking it up to 2.2, I really do want to get that value exactly right, 2.2, like so. That way we we don't harm the blacks or the whites. So we're not clipping any of the colors inside the image. Now, let's say you also want to increase the saturation. You know, if you if you if you want to adjust the color cast, remember patreon.com slash deek now. I'm going to go into detail about that in a, in a Patreon exclusive video. But if you just want to increase the saturation of the image, this, this is a lot to lay on you, but this is how it goes. You go to the A channel, you click in the black value, and you take it up, shift up arrow, and do it like, let's say four times. You just got to remember, you went up 40, now click in that white value and take it shift down arrow four times and it'll be 215. And that way I enhance the saturation of the tint, just the tint and nothing more. And so if I were to take this up even more, notice that I would increase the saturation values that much more, but I could also end up introducing a color cast. So I'm looking for 40 and 215, 215 is, and that's because 255 minus 40. And I'm going to do the same thing for brightness. I mean, for B. It's not brightness. Not at all. It's arbitrary B. It's temperature. And I'm going to take that guy up to the, the black value up to 40. And then I'll take the white value down negative 40 to 215. And what I've done, you can see this is without that adjustment layer. This is with. So not only am I dramatically brightening the image, but I'm also increasing its saturation. Now I want to once again direct your attention to the histogram panel. Notice channel is currently set to lightness. Might as well update that histogram just to make sure it's accurate. And notice we've got gaps like crazy, especially in the shadow region. That is where the noise is going to be a brewing by the way. And that's because you just expanded the heck out of the shadow. So consider this modification with a gamma value of 2.2. It started off with that gray slider right in the center. So I'll go ahead and set it back to 2.2 so you can see that this is a very good representation of what's going on. You took this range right here. You're taking this range because this is a live dynamic layer. You're taking this range, which is just strictly shadows, right? And you're expanding it to fill half the histogram. So well into the midtones. And that's why we have so many gaps here inside the shadow region and the biggest gaps are going to be the darkest shadows by the way and that is going to translate to a lot of noise inside the shadows but not as much noise as we saw when converting inside when correcting that is inside the rgb mode and then of course we're taking everything that what that is here this gray uh, slider uh, all the way to the white slider and we're compressing it into the upper range of the histogram and that's why we have fewer gaps in this region and this kind of double histogram effect. You can switch to composite if you want to. You can even switch to A and B. They're going to have gaps as well, which might be counterintuitive. You might say, well, wait a sec, didn't we just compress the 
B histogram as well as A. We, we assigned the same settings. No, what we actually did was we requested that Photoshop take what was formerly this range right here, 40 to 215, very dark to very bright, and expand it all the way to 0 to 255, black to white. And as a result, we get gaps. Now, you may, if you're paying astute attention, you may say, wait a sec, Deke. If applying an adjustment layer in RGB is less effective than applying camera raw in RGB, then certainly applying an adjustment inside a uh, lab, inside the lab mode, is is going to be less effective than applying a camera raw filter. Problem is... I'm not, it, doesn't, it wouldn't even make sense, basically, to apply camera raw in lab because of the distinctions between the modes and the way they work. But anyway, all the filter, the entire filter menu is dimmed, so you can't do that. All right, anyway, this is a, a way better way to work. Anyway, now I'm going to switch back to composite so we can see that we have a lot of gaps. I want you to see that. Now, what you want to do, this is how I advise you work, is go ahead and do any, any other modifications, make any other modifications you're going to make inside the lab mode. There might be others. You know, you could sharpen the, the, the L channel independently of the A and B channels. And that way you're just sharpening the detail and nothing more. So there's other stuff you could do. And then just go ahead and save any changes you make, right? You'd want to save this stuff so that you could always come back and modify that adjustment layer later. But you also want to convert the image to RGB for further Further, future modifications is what I was trying to say. And you do that by going to the image menu and choosing this. But if you do that, it's going to watch this. If I choose RGB color, it's going to ask me if I want to flatten the image because it just can't reconcile an adjustment layer. It can't translate the adjustment layer from lab to RGB. That's impossible inside Photoshop, by the way. So what you do is cancel out. Don't flatten it for yeah, because you mess up your original image. Go to the image menu, choose duplicate. And then just give it a new name or something. You don't have to name it here, but I'm going to call it RGB version or something like that. Select duplicate merge layers only. Click OK. And that way you just bring over the background. The adjustment has now been smooshed into it. So you just have that uh, flat image and nothing more. You may look at the histogram and be fooled and say, oh, that took care of the problem. We now have a gapless Histogram, no we don't. Update it and you'll see we got gaps galore in the composite channel, lightness, and all the others. However, if you now go to the image menu, choose mode, and now choose RGB, you will not see any kind of alert message. And that's because it's theoretically, once again, a non-destructive modification. And if you update that histogram, it's going to look nice and smooth. It's going to get look gapless. Anyway, it does have some spikes. It's a little rough on top isn't it but it doesn't have any total gaps in the shadows instead it's it's got these kind of middling gaps meaning that they are semi filled in so there's there's fewer uh pixels of this luminous level than the one right next door so you will see some noise artifacts here and there but it's amazingly smooth given that this is where we started my friends and this is our wonderful final effect so what do you think don't you just love lab or don't you just not give me a comment and while you're at it like subscribe and turn on notifications and don't forget to learn how to correct color cast with lab join my patreon which is patreon.com slash deke now and then go to deke.com and sign up for my newsletter i'm deke mcclellan this is deke now